Today, I want to talk about observability-driven development. Uh, and specifically, I want to, not driven development, I hate driven development, during development, um, observability during development. And specifically, I want to talk about legacy code, about making it more friendly to us as developers. Because legacy code is super important. It's it exists and it's running in production because it has value. And as such, it's my favorite kind of code to work on, but I think I'm weird that way. Uh, Austin talked about this this morning, about code that's been around for like 60 years, which is kind of scary. And it still is booking airline tickets for all of us. This code is really important. But it's not like how we usually identify as developers, right? Because we think, oh, I'm a software engineer. I write code. Okay, yeah, we learn how to write code. We consider ourselves good at writing code. But let's face reality. We change code. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, even like Agile embraces this. Get it into production and then start making it do stuff. Then start adding features. Um, Iterating on production code is what we do best. All right, so we want to change production code, and that's great. Code is easy to change as long as it has tests, right? <laughs> except, except legacy code. Uh, Michael Feathers, here he is, he defines legacy code as code without tests. I got to write some code the other day. It was really fun. I got to like exercise my actual writing skills instead of changing. But it was, I mean, it was a toy. It was for a marketing campaign and I wrote it and it was fun. And of course now that I made it do the one thing, that thing has entertained enough people that we want to make it more generic. Um, it draws pictures and traces. You'll see that in a minute. And we wanted to be able to draw different pictures and traces, right? And this means taking it a little more toward production code. Um, and do you think I have any tests? Of course I don't have tests. I, I don't have tests. But this, this thing just like, it reads files in the middle of wherever the heck it wants to read the file. It just does. And it, um, it has randomness. It has... Uh, uses the current date, all kinds of things that make it untestable. So, so my goal of making it like more configurable means that I need to move at least the file reading like to the beginning, right? Before I can make the change, I need to make the change easy. And that means I need to do some refactoring. And refactoring, again, is very easy when you have tests. But if you don't have tests, <laughs> then you need to write tests. That's one way to get to change that. But in order to run tests, you need your code to be testable. And this is the biggest lesson from functional programming for me. I studied this for a couple of years. And the biggest takeaway is don't read files in the middle of your program. Don't use date.now in the middle of wherever the heck file. Don't, don't um, pull a random seed out of the air, at least pass it in and make your code look more like this so that it accesses what it needs in the world at the beginning, does a bunch of processing in the juicy testable middle, and then has an effect on the world at the end. Okay, well, my code is not, it's not like this. I need it to be more like this. It'll make it more configurable, especially at the beginning part, but it's not there now. So, so what do you do? And Michael Feathers, in, in his book, he has a lot of very careful, uh, Abdi calls it free climbing refactorings that you can do of, of moves that are reasonably safe so that you can build the seams, so that you can make your code look like this, so that it's more testable, so that then you can, can refactor with a plum. But now, this book is a couple decades old, we have observability, we have open telemetry, and I propose that this is a tool that we can use to start bringing our legacy code under our fingers, uh, to make it malleable by us, to improve our understanding of it, and also to be able to see what's going on inside. Because the thing about refactoring is you're not supposed to be able to notice it, which makes it hard. I mean, if you have a full suite of tests, okay, you're testing that you didn't break anything, but did I change anything? 
it's really boring running manually testing the app over and over to see that it does nothing different. Uh, whereas observability is all about seeing the internal state of your application. So this means I can use observability, uh, I can use tracing to see the effect of my refactoring, like a positive effect that I wanted. And that's very satisfying. All right, so I wanna show you how that works. Um, oh, oh, right, and, and if I had used test-driven design, then all of this would be fine, but I did not listen to GPA. I just went out and coded it and I had a good time and now I'm suffering for it. So uh, gpahill.org, if you aren't familiar with test-driven design yet, recommend for code you know is gonna go to production. <clears throat> okay, so happy holidays. This is the, the program that I'm gonna do some coding on. And it we wrote it for Christmas. It does a cute Christmas thing. Here, I'll, I'll show you what it does. We'll start there. Um, I should be at the starting point. Um, if you want to follow along with the code, by the way, GitHub, I mean, I don't know why you would, but FYI, this is um, available on GitHub in Happy Ollie Days. I'm starting from Maine, but I'll be switching to an after branch later. So both of those may be useful to you. Right, right, let's, uh, let's run the thing. Um, when I run it, it's going to print a cow, show the cow, the cow says happy Ollie days. And then it has, Oh, look at that console.log. I should put that in a, in a span, um, here. Well, when I have spans, okay. So here's what it does. It, among other things, I'll show you one of the other things it does near the end. Uh, but this one's cute. It makes a trace and the trace waterfall has pictures in it. So this is a Christmas tree. See, see, and it, and it makes a little song in the names of the spans about the first day of Christmas. It's another Christmas tree. What else do we have in here? Lots of trees. This, oh, there's a smaller tree. Um, just trees this time. Okay. Sometimes it has ornaments. There's a, it is a little random. Um, so this, this is cute and I would like it to draw different pictures and maybe sing a different song that's not about Christmas because I'm really, really done with Christmas. Yeah, we'll deal with that again in November. Right, so um, the first thing I wanna do, cause I gotta like figure out how to move the configuration stuff around at the beginning and what, what do I need it to do? Um, let's start by adding a real span because you saw it output a trace, right? It outputted that that trace. This this program misuses open telemetry. I want to actually use open telemetry for like its stated purpose of tracing program execution. So we'll start in main. Let's see, main. There we go. We uh, this SDK here is the open telemetry SDK because this is a batch job and not a long running process. And because its whole purpose is to send traces, I want to be really careful that I've started up tracing and then I run the main body of my program and then I shut down the SDK, making sure that all traces are transmitted. Less important for a web server. Okay, but let's start by adding a top level trace describing the execution of this program. To do that, let's say I'll need a tracer. So a tracer I can get from the open telemetry API. Hotel here is, ah, oh, it's not going to show you. It's from OpenTelemetry slash API. Um, this is supposed to be hotel.trace.getTracer. Call it main, that's fine. And then I can take that tracer and from there I can start an active span. Start active span says, okay, I'm going to pass you some code. And for all the time that that code executes, Make this the parent span of anything that goes on inside of it. Get the span and then we call main, right? Right, and then we shut down the SDK. But that's not enough. I also need to end the span. Um, so inside the code that you pass to start active span, you have to tell it when the span ends. So after main completes, and end the span. Oh, but also if 
that the promise won't complete if it throws an exception. So I should handle exceptions as well by putting it on the span and then ending the span. Uh, great. Okay, so now whether main completes successfully or fails, I'm ending the span. Um, I'll go ahead and console.log the exception, but I'm not going to throw it again because I do want the SDK to get shut down and I want it to send that span and I want to be able to see it. Okay, I now expect to be able to see a single span that describes the execution of my program. All right, in, in the interest of, I'm like, okay, this this program writes spans in Honeycomb, that's what it does. But I want this to, this to be as vendor neutral as I can. So I've got Jaeger running locally um, and we can see this span in there. I have a local open telemetry collector running that's sending to both uh, Jaeger and Honeycomb at the moment. Okay, so we have happy holidays service and I can find traces. Okay, here it is, one span. Oh, and um, here's one of the big ones. You can see in Jaeger, here's some Christmas trees still. That's what it looks like in here. Uh, but here's our interesting one. One span in this trace, its name is main. Well, I can see that it took 734 milliseconds to execute my main function. Feels longer than that on startup. I think I think there's some node startup involved in that. It's not just my program executing. And then there's some tags, which are open telemetry attributes. They're not very interesting. These ones on the process are going to be common to every span that this program emits. Uh, let's add something more interesting. Um, Christine talked about always add your user ID and your customer ID. I don't have a customer ID. The, the most relevant here thing is um, this argument image file. This other one's always the same, so I'm not going to print it. But but I at uh, like high level functions and entry points, I really like to print all the, the relevant parameters that are going to affect the logic. Okay, now I'm in main. I don't have the span, but a fun part of OpenTelemetry um, at, at least in most languages, Go is a little different, but in general, you can always pull a span, the current span, out of the air. So if I do otel.trace.getActiveSpan, um, then I can do stuff to it, and I can set attributes on it, and I can say app.imageFile, and I can put that image file in here. I like to call custom spans app.something because um, then I can search for them and find the ones that are mine. I know which ones are like special that I put on there myself. Also, A, it's, a, it's near the top of the alphabet, so it shows at the top of the list. All right. Uh, so now I expect to be able to find a trace with a single attribute on it. And actually, I mean, I can go back to Jaeger and I can hit back and I can hit find traces again, but this is super tedious. Yeah. It's in there somewhere. Um, I'm going to give myself a link to the trace. Uh, so for debugging purposes and for local development, this is a really handy trick. Let's see, link, nope, link. There's a shortcut. So I'm gonna print the link to the span and I want to do that before I end the span. Print link to trace. And I need to do it here, both places that I'm going to end the span. So this is setting up this program to be friendly to me right now during development. I would put like an if debug mode around this in real life. All right, so we'll see the trace in Jaeger and the trace in Honeycomb. Run that again. Look for the cow. I think this is more than a second. But maybe it's because you're watching me that I feel like it's so long. And now I can go straight to the trace. Okay, there it is. Here's our trace, it says main, it has a tag, it has an image file, excellent. Okay, top level span check. I have some sort of structure that represents the activity uh, to me that's important. In this case, it's the whole run of the program. Next, I wanna see what I can get from auto instrumentation. So from the top level, let's go way, way down. At this point, I go to opentelemetry.io slash, apparently it's ecosystem slash registry, but just slash registry goes there. Not e-registry though. OpenTelemetry.io slash registry. And I get this searchy thing and I can be like, okay, I want 
JavaScript and I want instrumentation, what automatic instrumentation is available to me? And there's a list, there's a bunch. And at some point I looked at this and I found, H well, I just click something, don't click anything. Uh, HTTP instrumentation. And the other one that's gonna be super relevant is file system, because I know I'm reading in files. So let's start. I'm gonna start by adding instrumentation for HTTP and npm install open telemetry slash instrumentation HTTP. And then I'll go to initialize tracing. I mistyped that, but it's probably here anyway. I totally mistyped that. That's because the little share screen notification is over my command line. Um, okay, we got it. Now we go to where we initialize tracing. And here I have uh, the tracing set up. Um, I'm using a batch span processor, so all the transmitted spans are batched, but I've upped the size of the batch because I'm misusing open telemetry for this program. That's the point. Meanwhile, I want to add an automatic instrumentation. So actually, instr HTTP instrumentation, yes. That's good. And then down here, I can tell it to use one. There it is. And then I'm going to run it again and we'll see what we learn. I love adding automatic instrumentation. It's so fun because it's like a little prize when I open the span. What am I going to see? Ooh, now we have four spans in our trace. I have three HTTPS gets. If I look in the tags, I can see, aha, this one went to honeycomb.io slash auth. So the auth endpoint in Honeycomb. This one went to datasets, okay. And this one went to auth. This one went to auth again. Why did it go? That's annoying. I can see this a little better in Honeycomb. Let me put this in a table for you. It'll be easier to show on the screen. Uh, target. So I can add HTTP.target here. Now, there we go. So we can see there's two HTTP gets to the same endpoint and one at the beginning and one at the end. And it's like 283 milliseconds out of 800 milliseconds. That's a long time. And it's such duplication. And I'm like offended by the data flow in this application. This is not okay. So let's stop right here and refactor that. Uh, call it a refactor if you want. Call it an optimization if you want. I am going to change that. Dang it. Um, oh, but in order to change it, how am I going to change that? Go to my main function. Where'd it go? Give me there. Okay. Hold on. There. It's on the screen. Okay. I go to my main function and um, it's doing a bunch of things. Check authorization. That looks like a likely place, but where else is it called? All okay. right. So this is the part where I go back to the top and I'm like, okay. There are some important steps here. I want to wrap each of them in the span. Uh, these are important units of work. That's why they're like delineated like this in the main function. And each of them deserves the span. Okay, so to do that, I need to, let's see, I need to get an active span, start active span, uh, check off. That's the first thing we're gonna do. And then we're gonna do this. Okay, move that into the function. Oh, it needs to be async, and it gets this span s, so we can call s dot end. Oh, but really, I should be wrapping this in a try, and this should be in a finally, and I'm not going to type all that. I'm going to abstract it over here in something that I do have a philosophy that if you don't have a good name, use a really bad one, so no one will mistake it for a good name. Uh, so we have spaninate over here, and it's from spaninate async. Uh, which is starting an active span, calling the function, recording exceptions, ending the span. Uh, that's it. Oh my gosh. No, there's a bug in this. Oh no, there's not a bug. The s.end happens in the finally, so it'll happen both if the try succeeds and after the catch. Okay. So that's fine. We've abstracted this. Um, so now I can, I can spaninate I check auth. You do have to give it a name. 
Um, and in fact, uh, rather than type that, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to cut and paste for this entire main function. And this is everything wrapped in a spaninate, except the console.log. Import, import. Okay. Now I can see that I expect spans for check auth, init data set, greet, read image, plan span, send spans, and find link. And one of these later ones probably has that uh, that check auth, that extra call to slash one slash auth in it. Let's find out. Okay, run it again. So it, in, I'm making changes to the code, but they're just adding spans. So I feel pretty safe about it. Uh, which is why it kind of sucks when I broke something, but, um, what happened to my, there's greet, there's read image, but I only see one HTTPS. No, there's three. What's that one doing? What's that doing down there? Where's its parent span? What? Okay. I need to look at it in honeycomb. Oh my gosh. Honeycomb tells me that there are missing spans. And the other thing that this is telling me is that, look at this, here's my slash auth call and here's my data sets call. And these are now happening at the same time. That's, that's, that's wrong. Those, those were like in a row, right? They, they like waited on each other. They were sequential. I've broken the concurrency, which is incredibly easy to do because JavaScript so yes, it happens to be in a tracing that I did this, that I broke it, but I, I forgot to put the outer await in here. But the good part is I do that all the time in JavaScript. I'm always breaking the concurrency because it's hard. Concurrency in JavaScript is really hard, but tracing makes it super clear. Other languages too. I mean, in Go, there's always 80 things happening at once and you can see what's happening at once. And you can see what waits. These ones are synchronous. They're waiting on each other. Um, and now I added these await in there. I know uh, to put the awaits back in there, and that's going to make the spans get ended, and it's and then they're going to show up. And also, it's going to put things back in the right order. There they are. Okay, check off. Within that, we have the call out init data set after that completes, and then a, another get. Whew, okay. <laughs> That's a really helpful thing that tracing gives you. You're not going to get that from console.log. You're just not. It's so confusing. And now I can also see that this last HTTPS get, so the second call that I want to get rid of, is inside find link. Okay. So if I pop over to find link, maybe I can do something about this now. Where's find link? Here it is. It's, it's really useful to hard code your span names because that connects your traces to the code directly. You can search back and forth. Um, right. Find link to data set. What are you doing? Aha. Fetch authorization as expected. So it's retrieving this auth data out of that and using it. Well, what if we got that auth data as an argument? It happens to be an auth response. Yeah, and then we just didn't retrieve it at all. Yeah, over in main, we'll pass it in. Yeah, because we're going to get it from this first call to check authorization. Uh, auth data is that, and check authorization. It's retrieving that auth data from fetch authorization, same as the other one. And then it's just sitting on it. Return that thingy. Be helpful. All right. So I've now made a change that I expect to have no effect on the users other than being a little faster. Um, so I can't see it from the output of the program. It's still just drawing the same random trace. But if I look at the trace, yeah, yeah, find link is now 208 microseconds. And overall, this one completed in 637 milliseconds. That's that's pretty good. I think um, Jaeger might show us if that's better. Oh, but it's got all those other traces in it too, the big ones, the, fan, the, um, the pictures. So we can't really see a difference. Um, 
That's great. That's great. Let's see if we can see a difference in honeycomb. Da -da -da. Well, here's our trace. Yep, find link is super, super fast. Um, and we only see two HTTPS get calls. So like if I ran a query um, and I said, okay, count like the HTTPS get calls uh, group by trace ID, um, I would see there's a whole bunch of threes. Aha. And there's, I don't know how those, oh, hey, stop looking at the stuff I did half an hour ago. That's, that's cheating. Okay, there we go. So for the time range of this presentation, three, 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 two. So we've dropped that number and then we can do a heat map of duration if we want to see how slow they were. Um, oh, but these are just the HTTPS calls. I want to see the total ones. Name is main. We'll get me those. We go a heat map shows all the distribution of durations in this case there's just one of each w w there we go each one so eh, it's not really out of range i could run it some more in production this will show this heat map will show a lot more interesting stuff um but uh that's satisfactory uh these traces that that we just looked at i can get a before um and I can screenshot this or, or link to it, and I can get an after, click on this dot, and um, I can put that in a pull request. I can be like, look, this optimization uh, or this refactor, if you wanna talk about the data flow, this is useful. This makes our, our program kinder to downstream services and also faster for the people who use it. And that's really satisfying to be able to show a difference in, in an internal change. So I like that, I like that. But uh, what were we doing? Right, we were trying to move the reading of files earlier in the process. So back to that and let's add the file system stuff. I still have 20 minutes, perfect. Um, so there was auto instrumentation, open telemetry slash instrumentation dash FS. Uh, for file system access in Node, that's super handy. And then I'll go to initialize tracing and I need to bring it in. Instr. Um, there we go. I want the FS instrumentation. There we go. And then I tell it to have one. And then I run again. And now we get to see what prizes the file system instrumentation library has for us. Look at the trace in Jaeger. Oh, here's some stuff. There's our main and then in check off, it does a bunch of FS stat sync before the first HTTP call. And then, oh, look, look at them all. These are all read file sync is their name. And there's a lot of them scattered all throughout plan spans. Okay, well, what file are we reading over and over? Dig into the tags and nothing, nothing. It's, it's got nothing. It doesn't tell me anything, you stupid automatic instrumentation. Well, that's okay. Because I'm a developer and if my code doesn't tell me what I want it to tell me, I freaking make it tell me. <laughs> if this span isn't gonna be useful, I'll make my own dang span with my own dang attributes that I wanna see. Okay, so uh, that was read file sync was the name of that. Let's find where we call read file sync. Uh, one markdown file, here's one. Let's add a span around this. So let's see, I'll return spaninate, read PNG, because that's what we're doing. Get the span and then we'll put the code in there. Bring in spaninate. And then we can add the attribute that we want. App dot file name. File name. This is the trick. If your code isn't talking to you, make it talk. Teach it the words. The word that I want here is app dot file name. Uh, so when we run that, I expect to see more spans. I expect to see um, a wrapper around at least some of the read file sync spans. It's not the only place it's called in the code, but it's the main one. Um, and I expect those to have a file name for me. 
Okay. Well, it's not these. I think these are just related to the first time we use HTTP. Um, but the, aha. Okay. So this whole slew of read PNGs has our read file syncs has read PNG around it. And there it is. Tags, app.file name. Here we're looking at ornament. Now I want to look at all of them at once. So I'm not going to click through that over and over in Jaeger. I'm going to cheat and make Honeycomb show it. Uh, app.file name. Okay. There they are. There they are. We've got a don't peek.png, uh, a house.png, bigger tree, bigger tree, bigger tree, bigger tree, bigger tree, bigger tree, bigger tree. How many times are we calling bigger tree? I am going to group by this field and um, really we only found image group by app. Dot oh, that's image file. Where did I get? I just typed that wrong or picked the wrong one. We're looking for app.file name. There they are. Okay. Show only where it exists. And yeah, we're, we're, we're reading in ornament.png 20 times, bigger tree 10 times, be tiny tree, don't beacon house once each. And we can see like the distribution of that, um, of all of those are like, we do, 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 do. they're all part of plan spans. And that is something that I want to change. Um, I am not going to take you through changing that. Uh, I'm going to skip to one other place that I know I want to span, and um, then I'm going to bring in the branch that does change that and makes the thing configurable. Uh, before I bring in the branch, um, I want to, to uh, there's other places that I'd like to add spans. To make this testable, I need to move those file accesses to the beginning of the program. And I can also do that for the other things that I need to refactor out. So there's code that I know I need to move, which is like date.now in particular. Here, this is the call to date.now TypeScript. Um, and it is in the middle of things. It's in send spans, I can see. Uh, but let's pull that out and put it in its own function, export function fetch now. And then I can spaninate that. Um, spaninate fetch now. And we'll do that. And don't forget to return the output of spaninate. Also, don't forget to call the new function. Um, okay, so this is a refactor that I that I'm doing without tests or anything, but I feel pretty confident about this one and I'm going to be able to see its effect. Um, and then, then I will have like encapsulated this piece of code that I specifically want to move. Um, so you could do this with duplicated business logic that you're trying to converge and stuff like that. When, when there's a design change that you want to make inside the program, Sometimes, not always, sometimes you can express that in the spans and make the trace show you the change. I did run it. Here's this. And I would like to find fetch now. I don't know how to get Jaeger to search to work. Okay, but here it is. There's a fetch now here way at the bottom um, inside send spans. And I need that to to the other side. Okay, spoiler time. Uh, check out, oh wait, I'm gonna make a commit. And I'm gonna check out the after branch. And uh, then we're gonna run it again. The after branch has um, most of the configuration stuff moved into configuration like I wanted to. So let's go see how that looks um, with, um, with the change. Okay, so here is uh, read configuration, and then I'm reading all the JSON, or reading all the PNGs, only this many of them. I wonder which of these windows had that count in it. Hmm. <laughs> um, and then, oh, I can't search for fetch now here. Unspan found. 
oh, there's the fetch now, it's part of read configuration. And then um, the HTTP calls happen. And then there is plan spans and a bunch of other stuff going on. So let's see if I can find that graph. Didn't I have a graph? One day I had a graph. I'm gonna make another graph. Let's see how that shows up um, in aggregates. I can count, um, let's say where name is read PNG, group by trace ID. So in the different calls, how many times am I reading PNGs? 34 times, 34 times, seven times, six times. Oh, last 30 minutes during this presentation, please. Here we go. Six times I'm calling read PNG. So that's an improvement. And then I can go back and look at like name equals main. And uh, these are all the calls we've made. And then I can say, have we made it any faster or any slower? Um, and there, I, you know, I really, W, there we go. I can't tell the difference. It looks about the same to me at this aggregate. Uh, heat maps are a lot more fun if you have more uh, spans in them. So I'll just take out the where clause and you can see, see how that like the slower spans are up here and the, the higher duration and the lower ones are here. And um, in a heat map, uh, darker is more. So there's a whole bunch that were um, really fast right at that time. But heat maps are really fun <laughs> when you make them draw pictures. So here's the other thing that program does. If I heat map of height and I need 10 minutes, um, then you can see there, there's one. <laughs> there's one trace. So this is the cute little Christmas picture uh, that this program makes in a heat map. I really like it. It says observe and it has Santa and stuff like that. But now that it's configurable, um, I can run local, I can pass it a different argument, input spotcon config.json, and we'll see what we get from this. Run that again. Nope, not there yet. Wait for the cow. Wait for the cow, Jess. There's the cow. All right. Uh, run query. Ha. Oh, there it is. SpotCon in a heat map. <laughs> so that's the cute thing that this program does. Oh, and if I click into the trace, because I did configure it, um, that's supposed to be a tree and that's supposed to be an icicle. I'm not very good at this, but also they're kind of, they're kind of, messy. it's a different picture and, and it's, a bug so that the nesting of the child spans here to try to get them to appear in order of the trace i got it working and it's been working fine for the christmas input but there's definitely a bug here um in the in the ordering of these spans and the the nesting of them in a tree and that's going to be tricky to figure out but i'm confident that i can do it because i have uh, I have the execution spans. And I mean, different input, unexpected behavior, welcome to production. <laughs> People are gonna throw stuff at it that you did not expect in your test input. And the beautiful part is that these same traces that are gonna help me debug this next week or whenever I get around to it um, locally, are going to be there for me in production. Well, okay, not in this app because this app I, I don't operate. But but if this were as a service, it would totally be there for me in production. Um, and I can click in here and I can find out what was the content of the configuration file. I can see that here in the in the read configuration span, and then in all the other things that it's doing, I can see. Okay, it was deciding how many pixels to send per color. And it's telling me it's blueness density function that it calculated and, and the one that, that it got from config and so on. Um, so I have the information that I need to debug it. And that's one way that traces beat this not out of console.log because logs don't scale, even structured logs. They don't, they don't, they don't scale with concurrency like traces do. 
and and they don't scale with quantity of requests running at once and just generally uh, services that are hooking together, this is not a distributed trace. Distributed traces are even more valuable, but this is a local trace for a single service and it's already useful, uh, but it does scale up to multiple services because you can continue the trace between processes. And logs, I don't know, it just takes a lot of expertise, like very specific expertise to figure out the logs. And I don't want to have expertise. This is legacy code. If I had the expertise, it wouldn't be legacy code, which brings me to my definition of legacy code, oh, which is in here somewhere. Deep. So my definition of legacy code is code that we, as the team are assigned to work on it, don't understand. We don't have a relationship with it. We're not comfortable changing it because it's not alive in our minds. And that, I think, is really where observability helps us. It's not the only, the only tool that we use for this, but it's a big one because we get to teach our code to teach us what we need. Christine said uh, instrumentation, all those spans and attributes, all that code that I added today, this is how our code describes itself to us. So we teach it to teach us what the heck it's doing. There. So add tracing to your um, to uh, the code that you're working on that's being hard, especially if it doesn't have tests uh, or if the tests are insufficient. All tests are insufficient. Um, it can help you get an understanding, even when the code is not testable, and then you can have some confidence in changing it, even when you're not supported by a sufficient test suite. And also, you can make those internal changes visible. You can say, look, I made a change. See, I did something, and I don't have to sneak my refactors in. I can show them off sometimes, which is really cool. And then it's also there for us in production. And I can go in production, I can say, what does the trace look like now? How is it different? Maybe in production, some of those HTTP calls are a lot less, um, less of a fraction of the total. And maybe reading the file over and over, maybe it will make a difference that we reduce that um, in scale or a different environment or whatever. Um, and then when unexpected co input comes in, I have the data that I need. Um, to, to achieve this, I started by making a span at the top level. Uh, if you have a web app, um, then you wouldn't instrument main, probably. You would instrument uh, the incoming requests. But actually, you probably wouldn't start that yourself. You'd use the automatic instrumentation. So step two is the same as step one in that case. Uh, the automatic instrumentation generally gives you a structure uh, to start with. It'll give you an outline. And if you're between services, it'll also handle the propagation of the trace context between them. Um, if you're talking, hooking up to other services, then add your key parameters. Uh, as soon as that request comes in, add that user ID, add that um, product ID or whatever it is that's crucial to your business, get that on that, that span right away. Um, and then, then what else do you need? Uh, you can add the rest as you go typically, uh, fill in the spans that are important that say something meaningful. Plan spans is a meaningful step. Send spans, meaningful step. Um, and oh, and then the other thing I did uh, that you can't really see, uh, well, you could if I showed it to you. Um, I went in and took all the console.logs out that I had put in there for myself uh, when I was just making this work for Christmassy stuff. I put in a bunch of console.logs and warnings to tell me when I was hitting boundary conditions that weren't going to work. And I turned all of those into attributes on the spans because now I have a different place to describe how the program is functioning. And that's going to be useful to me. I mean, if it were a normal program, it would be useful in production. Uh, but those those span attributes, okay, yes, when I'm looking for what the heck is a blueness density function, if I console.log it, it shows directly um, in my console, it's a little faster than having to click through to go look at the trace. I hope we can make that faster someday, but still. However, within the trace, I see the full context and I can be like, oh, wait, when the blueness density function was this, what was the configuration? And I can look up and I can see what else happened. So getting all that information into a trace that tells a story, super useful during development. 
the end. Yay. I'm sure people are clapping at home. I just, just assume that they're clapping at home. Okay. Um, this is always the difficulty of the virtual virtual situation. Jessica, that was amazing. Um, particularly, my, my favorite part was the sound effects um, <laughs> that you made as things were zipping around effect. the screen. Yeah, <laughs> did, did you not know? <laughs> no, I, I don't. I, I assure you, you in fact <laughs> make sound effects. You're like, I'll just move this you. over here. <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. All right, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> There was uh, there was a question. Um, also, people really loved your heat maps. Um, oh, good. The one hey. question that we had was, is there any theory to writing observable code as opposed to writing testable code like you mentioned towards mm. the beginning of the presentation? Oh, what a great question. Um, I don't think there's like published theory about this other than instrument it. Uh, but, but that is like kind of what I'm trying to put forth in this, this presentations like this one, um, is, is that theory of make sure your, your incoming requests in a web service or main, or if you're pulling messages off a of queue, every message is going to be its own trace. Make sure you you're specific about when you start your trace, um, and then add the key parameters. I like to add an attribute to the span whenever I make a decision. Like if I have a, if the span count is greater than the max, do this, otherwise do that. That's a clue that the two things I'm comparing should be on the span. Um, yeah, the, so the, that I think is a developing body of work. So, so maybe maybe when we, yes, time, time for you to write a book. <laughs> you, you made the mistake of saying maybe I should write something about this. I said a blog post. Yeah. I said a blog post. Okay, well, that's, I that's you way off sooner blog post. <laughs> and freer than a book. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, yes, it, I feel like, yeah, 600, 800 words, you can cover something, and then someone else will be inspired to write a book. That, that's me. excellent. I feel like uh, books require attention spans, and that's something I just don't have. Um, but Jessica, that's awesome. Thank you for the answer. Thank you for the talk. Thank you for capping off an awesome day. At Spotcom, and and uh, I I'm assuming everyone I you know a few people asked it's at Jessatron just about everywhere. Oh yes, uh, Jessatron.com, Jessatron at Honeycomb.io, Jessatron at Hackyderm.io for Mastodon. Um, right on. Jessatronica on here because apparently I had an account from last year that I don't know what email address that was under. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I, I will. I will talk to the developers at Vito to help them understand that retrieving the account should be easier. And but, PJ, you have been amazing today. You have been here oh. all day by yourself, and I think, I think this conference owes you a big debt. Good oh, job. I, you know, it's. I I love to do it. It's for the community. Anything that builds a community, you know, I love communities. So, you know, if this means, you know, we stretch the hotel, there's just a few more people who understand a little bit more then I'm completely happy. There's no debt whatsoever. Well, good work. And I hope you have a really good thing to drink after this. Thank you. I, I definitely will. <laughs> Jessica, until I see you next time, take care and thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of our speakers uh, who have been here throughout the day. Thank you to the folks at Scout APM, Telemetry Hub. Thank you, of course, to all the attendees who, without which we would have no purpose whatsoever. Um, but uh, I, we've made SpotCon 2023 an amazing thing. I hope everyone had an amazing day. Uh, I think you all know because you're watching this, but in the Veto platform, that is an open platform. You can communicate there with people who you met today. And people who are at SpotCon 2022, where we use the Veto platform and have conversations about performance, observability, transformation, all these things that we talk about at SpotCon um, throughout the year. You don't have to, it's not just a one time thing. So feel free to do so. People will be notified if you reach out to them. Other than that, um, please keep an eye out for things that are coming up. And we will see you at SpotCon 2024, um, TBD, because obviously I do not know when we're actually doing that. Until then, Take care, and I'll see you soon.